Welcome to Sports Chat with Matt. I'm here with my second guest, Trayvon Jackson. He is an all-time Badger great who became the starting point guard for Wisconsin a few games into his sophomore year. He was all Big Ten tournament team in 2013, NCAA tournament all-region team in 2014. He was one of the all-time great leaders, most clutch players ever to wear a Wisconsin uniform, and he has played professionally in then the D-League and also overseas, um, and he was an all-star over in Slovakia. Trayvon, welcome to the show, and how are you doing today? Man, I'm doing great, man. Appreciate you having me on. I'm doing wonderful. Good deal. To start, we talked about it a little bit off camera, but you are officially retired from hoops now? Officially, I officially retired from playing professionally. I said like that. I still give some people I work with or some 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 park guys some buckets here and there. <laughs> I ain't playing no defense. No defense, but just all, you know, catch and shoot, post moves, give me a one-on-one move here and there. But, uh, yeah, I, I ain't playing no defense. I'll give buckets that way. <laughs> All right. A little, little bit. You're like James Harden. You're that lefty just dropping buckets on one hey. end and uh, giving up buckets on the other. Yelling at everybody, like, hey, make sure you get a stop. I'm in hell. I'm in hell. <laughs> but you got you to gotta guard the guy. I'm not, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but I imagine you're quite the problem for average shows at your uh, local YMCA <laughs> or the park. Yeah, I can as long as I can be, you know, be a, be effective offensively. Am I trying to play with these guys that still, you know, in the league and things? Um, I did my I did my fair share. Though. I'm good now. I'm good. <laughs> sure. You were having a really good year overseas in Sweden. Um, mm-hmm. your last season in the 1920 season, you were averaging 12.3 points per game, 5.3 rebounds, 3.1 assists, 1.2 steals per game, shooting an efficient. 47.5% from two and 36.1% from three having a great year. Um, and I was listening to your podcast and you said that you were dealing with some Achilles uh, issues that yeah. year. And you also, you know, COVID shut the season down uh, quickly. Yeah. So what role did uh, COVID have in your retirement and what role did injuries have in your retirement? A lot. And that's a great question because I got to a point, I was a work, I was a work, workout holic basically you know i've grown a lot in these last few years but specifically back then i felt that i had so much time in my career when i had a, a year and a half off that i had time to just catch up to get to where i wanted to get to in my career so i worked out non-stop 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 and eventually my body just broke down it just wasn't able to handle the time periods that i worked out now because of the stretching routine and because of the you know recovery routine, the the prayer that I had in place, I was cool, but I wasn't like, I still felt the effects of it. Like I had to spend an hour a day, pretty much uh, a recovery every day. I had to get to the, to the gym 45 minutes before just to warm my body up. And then after the season, during the season, so I was, I was mentally, I was at the highest point I ever was. The game was slow. It was very easy to get anything I wanted in the game. But physically, I had to I – mean, I'll use Chris Paul as an example. It was like I had to think the game more than I actually do. And then um, when COVID hit, it gave me a chance to really evaluate what I wanted to do in life outside of basketball. I had I had a chance to do that beforehand because I had uh, – my goal was to get to the G League, and I did. I got to the G League. I got to minicamp. That was my main goal, get to the G League minicamp. And I did. I got a chance to play with the Bucks mini camp going into that year of Sweden, but ended up going into the G League uh, camp and with, for a lot of various reasons, wasn't able to make the team. Right. I felt I prepared. I did everything I need to do. I did everything. Like me, you were talking before. And I worked all summer, worked everything. And then, boom, I don't make it because of similar situations of like, you know, upper management things, those those days of that nature. But I also was bummed out on myself, more importantly than anything, was because I felt like I didn't get my best foot forward to force them to, to hold me. So during that time, I was out for about a month or two before, before I went to Sweden, deciding where I wanted to go. So I was deciding then, like, I can't keep going through this up and down. I got to figure out what I'm going to do outside of basketball because otherwise if basketball is my only thing, I'm going to go crazy sitting here wonder when I'm going to go play, when I'm going to go do this, that. And so I really started to look into, uh, you know, sports broadcasting. I started to look into podcasting, things like that of that nature. 
And I started to have that thing in place already. So I knew what I was going to do, regardless when the season was over, whatever. I knew I was going to go play, but I knew what I was going to do off the court too. So we go through the season, Sweden hits, COVID hits. I already knew where I was going. I already knew my plan for this. I already knew everything. So I just transitioned into that while still working out. So I worked out all summer, all autumn. And then as the time period kept going on, I realized, man, I'm not really finding as much joy as I am with the game because I have satisfaction. The things that I was longing for, I actually have that. For me, I was a big one, like love and like having a family and camaraderie and things like that. And that's what the game brought to me. You know, love from publicity, love from teammates, love. But I found those things off the court and I realized, man, I like the game, but I don't really love the game like that. I never really loved the game. I loved what it brought, but I didn't love the game. And I was just like, I can keep going like this. I can keep doing this recovery and warming up and all this, but I don't really want to. And that's when I knew uh, inwardly, you know, I had a I had a great divine moment where pretty much I knew God was telling me, like, what you playing basketball for, you don't need to, bro. Like, you already got it. Like, you good. I gave it to you here. You got you looking for the love that you, you got it here. And I realized, like, I can keep playing, but I don't want to. I want to do it on this side of things, which is what I'm doing now, which is helping guys out on the mental performance side of things, really helping them maximize their careers, because that's what I really like. That's what I really enjoy doing. So that's that's a long spill, but that's what led to – me walking away from the game playing. Okay. <laughs> so now you, you've transitioned um, into, well, actually just tell, tell me, tell the, the listeners, what are you up to today? So I'm a player development specialist and I help uh, run IGI sports. We're a sports agency of our parent company called success epitomize. So I, I specialize in helping guys reach mental peak performance. And we really help in five main areas main area we help them in is player development like on the court off the court things like that performance we help them in life coaching right that's our second thing we help them in uh heavily financial literacy coaching and things like that with finances we help them with divine business coaching and we help them with professional speaking like those are five main keys that we help out our players with in our agency and so i can do those exact services outside the agency but that's my focus and that's what we do, man. We really help out. Got, got a chance to work with a lot of NBA guys, uh, some guys overseas as well, um, getting geared up right now because right now, just at June, we're getting ready to start for our off-season uh, training here soon, uh, this month in about a week or so, and really helping guys reach peak performance. When I'm not with them in person, we do the things uh, through virtual online, uh, focusing on mental, right, the mental part of the game, uh, studying film, reaching mental peak performance in yourself, the things that we deal with, you know, things of that nature. So it's a lot that we do. That's, that's the basis of it though. Oh, right, good deal. So how are you liking it? I love it, man, because for me, it's personal. It's personal because I did it for my life and it worked. I'm big on like, I can't mm -hmm. give something to someone that I don't believe in. Like I got to believe in it. And sure. I did this in my life because of my mentor, who actually ended up being my goddad, Dr. Anthony Roman. He's the founder and CEO of the companies uh, that we work with. He started this agency, and I came up under him and his agency, right? Um, and we're just expanding it now. And he helped walk me through the things that now I'm helping others walk through. Sure. And I'm so passionate about it because it actually worked for me. I went from not being able to play, told I would never play point guard, told I would never play at Wisconsin to starting my sophomore year, like you said, us going back to back final fours. Like this is stuff that we all predicted and stuff that we all prepared for, prayed for, asked for, did all these things. Yeah. When nobody knew, nobody believed. But I was like, you're crazy. Stop saying we we prepared for this. I, I did this while my pro career where you know, I went from a year and a half out to not having zero film of things to still getting overseas and them being like, well, you have no film, but we're going to take a chance on you. Like, that's how it was. And like, I experienced this thing so many times in my personal life 
not just seeing it outwardly, but in my personal life where I know it works. And I just really want to help other guys experience what I experienced in a higher level. Awesome. You had some really unique experiences in your career. So, you know, some ups, some downs, and Mm -hmm. I imagine some things you can use from your career, you know, that may have not been fair at the time Mm -hmm. and may have been really tough to go through at the time. But I imagine you can use those same experiences to relate to others and help them grow in their their lives and their careers. Um, How have you used your experience to help others grow? The the thing with the league is working with league guys and professional guys. I've experienced pretty much everything they've experienced, minus um, playing at at a level that's high um, in the NBA on a championship type of team or things like that. But like the day to day process of being a basketball player, professional basketball player, I understand. I know exactly what you're going through. I know exactly the thoughts you're going through. I know exactly what you're thinking about when it comes to finances. I know exactly what you're thinking about when you come to family and your image that you're portraying. I know exactly what it comes to when you're thinking about with your coaches. I know these things. And if I don't know these things, I can send you to someone higher that does know these things. I'm not going to sit here and act like I know them all. Like, no, if I don't know, I'm going to let you know. I know somebody that do know. Here, go down. And that's the beautiful thing about our structure that we have things set up is we're really a family in how we approach our our clients and the people that we help. What is really important for me to not just treat them as property and things like that, but to actually have a relationship with people and to let them know, like, bro, I get what you're going through. This ain't me just spewing out some information because it's, you know, cross pound dribble right. And when you shoot it at 45 degree angle, it's going to get in. Like, no, nah, bro, look, you got to shoot it up like this because you're trying to play against a footer and that's not going to get off. Trust me, it's not going to work. You don't believe me? Go ahead and do it. <laughs> so that's how I kind of talk to people, relate to them, because I've been there. I've done that. You understand. You, it's a total difference when you go through it versus when you're on the outside looking in. So definitely relate to guys. Uh, that That's awesome to hear that you're doing great and that you're loving what you're doing. I mean... And that, that's a really cool job you have there, helping others reach their goals. I mean, that's that's awesome. Um, so now let's transition into some current Badger basketball. Okay. Uh, how much how, how much have you been able to follow Badgers basketball over the last few years? And uh, what do you think of the job that Guard did this past season? Man, Guard did a wonderful job. I'm so proud of Coach Guard because he really – came into a situation that wasn't necessarily set up for him to succeed and he's done so. And I got, I, I didn't follow them as much as when I left, I followed the guys more like Nige and Bronson and, you know, Jordan there and the other guys that were there. So we, um, but I wasn't like as in te- uh, keenly intent on like watching them and doing things. I really got a chance to like, watch them more this year more than i ever have in the last five six years since i left because i got a chance to see them when they came out to uh play in vegas uh, which is where i reside at and they got a chance to uh they got a chance to play in the maui invitation where they got transferred yeah. over to mandalay bay coach gar reaches out to me and was like hey man i heard you were in town i heard you're out here and the fact that he even heard I was out here was amazing because nobody knows. I'm very private on, like, what I do. And so I'm figuring, like, how did he figure this out? <laughs> well, a week before, my dad got inducted into the Hall of Fame for College Basketball Hall of Fame. I run into Andy Katz there. Andy Katz, you know, he used to be with ESPN, now Big Ten, um, and Fox. He's like, man, how you doing? How's everything going? Where you at now? I'm like, I'm in Vegas, boom, boom, boom. He sees Coach Guard and lets him know. Hey, I just ran into Trayvon. So Coach Gar reaches out to me like, hey, I heard you're in Vegas. You coming to the game or what? And I'm like, let's do it. And for me, that was huge because I kind of left on a on a rocky note from school, not because of anybody else's decision, but strictly because of my personal things that I chose to do. And Coach Gar was the one was the one coach that like came to my apartment, talked to me, you know, sat down with me and like. You know, he even prayed with me at the time, like, yo, bro, you sure you good? Like, like really caring for me. Yeah. So I really was there to when it was good to see him and just talk to him. That was the first time I seen him in a long time. And I was so happy to see his success and him lead the guys and him open up the floor. Him yeah. like a guy like Johnny 
play the way he played in freedom. A guy like Brad do what he do. You know, the whole team together come together and play and while still keeping a foundation that they stick to, but still have a freedom that they reminded me, quite frankly, of us. Yeah. Reminded me a little bit of us. It's not just Johnny played very free. It was tough for other guys, like Brad did as well. It was tough for everybody else too, just because they're still learning, I think. They're younger. But we got to that point where all five of us were out there playing. You know, we we got a hot field. Let's shoot it, run. We were doing things that so it was I was hoping that they could go farther, but it was just it was definitely fun to see. I, I I'm gonna keep watching and moving forward for sure. That's fine. Oh, that's it. that's an awesome story to hear about guard. I, I like guard. I like guard even more after hearing that story. I mean, that's that's awesome. And it was amazing to see guard have that success, especially after you know the controversy with the, mm-hmm. the leaked recording and the off season. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of people were, if it feels like a lot of people are rooting against guard, a lot of people have mm-hmm. things to say about guard. And then next thing you know, like the Badgers evolved, they're playing way mm-hmm. different than they did the past season. They're playing free. They're playing together. It looks like the guys are having fun. Uh, it looks like they really like each other and, uh, guard won coach of the year after yeah. everyone was a you know, piling on him when he was down. And then he goes and he, he rises above the hate. Um, so, yeah, you, you want to talk a little bit about that there? Well, I know that situation caused – I know that situation caused Guard to be even more personable than he was because for being an assistant coach is totally different than being a head coach. An assistant coach, as he was an assistant coach, his job was focusing on the X's and O's behind Coach Ryan's overall organizational structure keeping things in place, making sure that we as a team function together as one. But it was like Coach Ryan was like our Phil Jackson. Guard was like our Tex winners, right? So for him to be able to transition, to be able to hug on guys after interviews, for him to be able to love on guys, for them to speak the way they spoke about him, that wasn't the proofs in the pudding at that point. There's nothing else you can really say besides, well, this leaked video comes out, this and this and that, but this is what they're saying about him. And that's more than what you ever, what you could ask for, what you can want. Not dismissing the allegations or dismissing the things that the people dealt with, because I don't know. I'm not, I wasn't there. I didn't deal with that situation. I don't know. But I do know guard and I do know what he was able to do when he moved forward from there. And to me, that's a testament to his resilience and his steadfastness on, I'm willing to grow from this. And I'm also willing to, uh, adapt and evolve and, and, and be and, and develop in this situation too to where now we're going to create a, even a better uh, brotherhood and environment while we're here and that's what led to the success that it led to 100 percent, and it makes me think that that leak tape could be one of the best things ever to happen to guard because they can force oh, him yeah. to change on the way that he does things and force him to be more personable, like you said. I think that oh, yeah. that could be a total blessing in disguise. Well, because as a player, you have to find a reason to play for something, to play that, to give that amount of effort day in and day out. And if your coach, if you don't like your coach, it's going to show. Like, it's going to show. So you can't tell me that they didn't necessarily like him uh, or like the situation that he did because day in and day out, they gave effort all the time. Now, I can't speak to people's personal relationship with him, but like they gave an amount of effort that only comes from, man, he got to care about me as a player. They're, they're thinking about this for coaches. I mean, like he got to care about me in this situation. Like if he, if he letting us do this and that gives you added motivation and things like for us, when we play, even though we might not have had a particular close relationship with Coach Ryan while we played, we all had a commonality and a common goal that we were going towards. So they had a commonality and a common goal they were going towards, and it makes it way easier in that situation, in their situation where, like, they just coming off of this controversy. It Stuff would have came out again if it was if it was worse. Like, you see what I'm saying? So I definitely think that, it was a blessing in disguise man, because it caused him to go deeper and to actually pull that personable side out of him, which as players we love. Yeah. yeah, get on me, get on me, but let me know that you care about me too. And he was very adamant on letting players know, like, I love my players. 
I'm like he's hugging him after the like I love this guy like the Johnny and Brad and other guys like that. And pr- Chucky started as a freshman like that never happens like you know what I mean. So that's this things that I think that is is there that 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 you see is there a lot of other things behind the scene of course but I got a chance to experience the staff to see them and my experience was great. I can only speak from from that instance. Yeah. Um, and talking about, you know, Chucky, Brad, Johnny, did you have any players in particular that you really enjoyed watching this past season? Well, obviously Johnny, uh, Johnny, because of his fearlessness, um, Johnny has great fearlessness when he plays, he's able to actually affect the game in multiple ways, both offensively and defensively. Um, I love him being able to get to his pull up, but more than anything, the thing that he stood out to me his most, his best attribute as a player, not just his skill set. Not just as athleticism, not his playmaking abilities and scoring abilities, but it's really his confidence and his fearlessness. If he keeps that confidence up, he's going to have a heck of a career. He's going to have a very long career. And if he makes a couple of tweaks to his game, dealing with his offensive capabilities, he has a chance to be like very, very, very special. He has a chance to be pretty much the best Badger of all time to come out of UW and to have a heck of an NBA career. Wow, that's some really high praise right there. I mean, that's that's awesome to hear. And you know, it's he got a chance. That's what I was like. He got a chance. Well, he just saying that, past. just saying that he has a chance. I I know you're not yeah. saying yeah, it's said it's stolen or anything, but just the fact that you're saying he has that chance to unlock that within himself and to you know yeah. to make the changes to be uh, you know a legend there. I mean, that's awesome. Yeah. That, that's awesome. I mean, to... you, you you can argue it's between Mike and Devin Harris, Michael Finley and Devin Harris. So. You know, Wisconsin hasn't had a wing like him since since Mike, Michael Finley because Alondo was a wing, but Alondo played more in a four. Yeah. And he played more in a, you know, and then the other wings that we usually had were shooters. Joe Krabinoff, uh Tim Jarmus, uh, you know, guys that – and they were either smaller shooters too, like Ben, my my heir, Ben, uh, ben Bruss or Josh, who played on the wing as well. Sam had a chance to be in the wing as well, but he more – coach played him more at the four. You know what I mean? He's playing more of a wing now in his pro career, but like Johnny was like a true legit two, two guard. We hadn't had that since that type of player like that and handled the ball like that since a Michael Finley. Yeah. So he got a chance. He got a yeah. chance. Yeah. So now let's get into uh, your career a little bit. Um, and let's start with your, uh, sorry, in high school, you were the all-time leading scorer at Westerville South. And uh, mm-hmm. you ended up going to Wisconsin, obviously. But was Ohio State your dream school growing up with your dad having been a legend there? Um, was that the school you wanted to go to? And well, how, that, what was your reaction? You know, they didn't – I know they didn't recruit you. Um, yeah. So, yeah, talk about that a little bit. Well, they they, they recruited me. Um, they recruited me up until my sophomore season. And uh, they just had – by the time we got good, we had pretty much – Three good guys in the Central Ohio area. Central, yeah. Me, uh, Trey Burke, and Travis Trice. And then we also had a guy up north named Trey Lewis. We had four guards that were very successful guards coming out of Ohio. None of us went to Ohio State. And it was because of the time they had recruited a guy out of uh, Atlanta, Georgia. His name was uh, Shannon. um, Scott. Shannon Scott. Yep, Shannon Scott. So they had Shannon Scott, and they also had Kraft, Aaron Kraft there. So. Of course, did I want to offer? Did I want to go there? Of course. You know, growing up in Columbus, it's like every Saturday, this t- the whole city shuts down for the Ohio State game. You know, uh, but Ohio State was big on football. I wanted to go there. Obviously, my dad's legacy and things. I did. I wanted to go there. But once it got to a point where I realized it wasn't necessarily a realistic opportunity, that went away pretty quickly as far as, you know, I didn't I didn't trip on it as much as like, Oh, they're not recruiting me or they're this. Now that I have an extra edge while playing against them, of course, I definitely did. But it realistically from their situation, they already had guys that they had. Like Kraft is an all-time legend there. And I, looking back on it, it's like, okay, if I do go there, would I want to play the two, playing alongside him, being like a – because him and Shannon Scott shared a lot of minutes, but it was like, would that have been what I really wanted to or what I really wanted to run the helm, you know, run the point like I did at school? Like, I had a great career. I've been proud of that. So definitely looking back on that, did I want it? Yeah. Was I upset about it? In hindsight, no, I wasn't really upset. Oh, wait. 
but th- did it add did it add a little bit of that feel to the fire you know where oh like, yeah wisconsin you know I, I i was it down i believe arizona state and wisconsin were the final two and to that yeah. you know just add a little bit like hey wisconsin's gonna play ohio state i'll get to come home you know yeah coach ryan i said this the right time coach ryan he was like a he was a, a savant in, in his recruiting because he told me everything i wanted to hear I'm 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 in the middle. I'm downstairs, you know. At one of the it was I remember this. It was at the after my junior season, and a guard had been calling me, like letting me know, like, hey man, you you got to make a decision, and because they were pressing for me to commit, but then they've heard they got wind that I was going to commit to Arizona State, which I was because it was set up for me there. Herb Sendek was great friends with my high school coach. They were my first big offer. Like they flew all the way out there to my open gym and about to offer me on the spot, but they didn't. And I played the best I ever did. They came to games like they loved me and I was going to commit. And Coach Gar- uh, Coach Ryan calls me and was like, hey, so I heard you're about to uh, commit. <laughs> and I was like, how you hear that? Like who told you this? Because I didn't, I kept my circle small. And so uh he uh he was like yeah i heard you're about to commit um they got a lot of guards there you sure you want to do that like you sure you want to go and i was like man do they have a lot of guards there they do like but i'm not even looking at they got jordan at, at wisconsin they got josh at josh guys and they got ben breast george marshall just committed these are all legit three guys that's like for sure going to play and that were better than me at the time period in their particular specialty, right? I wouldn't say overall. I think the the main guy overall that was better than me for sure was Jordan. But, like, Josh was a specialty. He could play beside Jordan. He could shoot. Ben could shoot, and Josh could shoot and defend. Ben could really shoot. George could score again with the best of them. I'm just me. I'm kind of good at each one, but not great at them. So I'm looking back like, Man, you're right, coach. I, I'm gonna go ahead and I can play home. Let's do it. So that definitely was what led to me to choose Wisconsin. Um, and then I it just added more of a chip. I just had a chip to answer your question about Iowa State. I just had a chip in general. So anybody that I played against, I had a chip on my server because I was proven not only to them, but I was proven to actually my own self and everybody else, the coaching staff, that I can do this position and stuff so everybody got it <laughs> not yeah. just Ohio State but everybody did when Bull Ryan's recruiting you f- from my knowledge he doesn't make unrealistic promises what I what I heard and, and tell me mm-hmm. if it's true or not but like he, he says stuff along the lines like hey I'm gonna give you a chance to compete for minutes and I'm gonna give you a chance to really good education um is yeah. that kind of how it was or yeah, well, they, for me, they really sold me on. They wanted me to be the next Jordan Taylor, pretty much. And at the time, Jordan was the best point guard in the country. Yeah. So that's a no-brainer for me. Like, why wouldn't I not do it? Arizona State, I wanted to go there because of James Harden, right? He came out, and they had another point guard like Matt Gatins, who was really good, too, at the time. But Coach never necessarily promised me anything. He did a good job of being personable during the recruiting process, right? He really made it personable to make it feel like, and at the time period of who I was, you know, to get Big Ten love was huge because they were pretty much the only Big Ten school to really kind of recruit me. And I had more um, ACC like Notre Dame and, Dayton and and a lot of the Mac schools and then obviously Arizona State out west, uh, some other smaller schools as well. But those are like my main kind of so for him to be able to do that was like, okay, this is big, like this is cool. So he did a good job of doing that. He didn't promise. I give him that. He didn't promise anything, but he did say this is what we envision you to be like. Mm. To me. That's like laying out the found the, the the foundation for weeks. We expect to hand you the keys. Me yep. not knowing, I'm like, well, you gotta go in there and earn the keys too, though. Still, <laughs> yeah. So that was a great, great lesson I learned. 
Now let's transition to your journey at uh, UW, your time at UW. You kind of talked about this earlier that you had a chip on your shoulder uh, mm-hmm. and listening to your podcast. You, you had the mindset your first two years, like, hey, I'm going to come in. I'm going to buck everyone. Like, I'm coming mm-hmm. right at everyone's throats. Um, and that, that mindset really changed for you, I believe, heading to your junior year. Yeah. What happened and why did that mindset change? Well, God happened. <laughs> like pretty much plain and simple. Um, I was presented with an opportunity where I knew it wasn't sustainable to keep that chip. I'm like some some people are just built differently. Some people can play with that chip just depending on like like quite simply, like that wasn't that's I'm not that type of that my spirit can handle it. Like I couldn't have all that burden on me. I couldn't deal with that daily on a day-to-day basis. I was just, I had to let go pretty much. And that's when I came into um, In God's Image, which is a, um, which is the agency that I work with now. At the time, my mentor, um, he was the one that showed me that there could be a different way. There's a different way that this can work. I had already met the guys my freshman year of college, but like this year I really made it. A, a choice to like, man, I'm going to really change my life for the good. And that's why I, I quite simply said God, because for me, bro, like it was nothing else besides God just presenting me with options. Like, look, if you go forward with this, this is the type of career you're going to have. If you have this chip on your shoulder and you just don't allow me to come help. You. If you go forward and allow me to come help you, then we can make a whole path that was different. And for me, basketball was my life. So I'm like, well, that's an easy option. I'm going with this option, God. Let you in. What you need? Let me give up my life. So I, at the time, I gave up everything that I knew to do, which was basketball. I gave that part of my life up, and that was allowed for me to have the best part of my career that everybody remembers at Wisconsin with all the game winners and the impactful wins that we had and things like that. That was there in the time that really shifted for me because I was just done, man. Like, quite simply, I was done. I was done fighting. I was done, you know, fighting against the world. Like I wanted to let that stuff go. And uh, and that's that's what made my decision different going into my junior year. Okay. And your junior year, you had a really, really nice year. And how much would you credit that to your your mental change? And how much mm-hmm. would you credit that to physically improving in the off season? Both, because my mental change allowed me to release more of my physical abilities that I worked on in the off season. It was the first off season that I went home for the whole summer. So, you know, I came uh, that year. I, can't, I think I might have went to school for like maybe like a week or two. But like the majority of the summer, I was at home working out with the guys. And I made a huge jump because confidence wise, it helped me get home and deal with my mental performance, deal with who I am as a person first, then a player. So when I came back, I was on a whole nother level. You know, I remember even Coach Ryan pulled me in and I told him I had a meeting with him. I said, Coach, you know, I'm going to come home for the summer and do my workouts here. And he said, well, you know, that's you got to be up here for the team. I was like, I get that. But like my main thing is I want to prepare for the season. This is best for me that I need to go for the season. And he said, uh, well, you know, we got a Bronson Caden coming in, you know, top rank guy, you got to be ready. And, you know, cause he can play and coach was doing what he's supposed to do. Like push me. I was like, no, nah, I get that. And he's supposed to come in and Bronson's supposed to come in and push me. He's supposed to come in here. And cause Bronson was highly touted, like, you know, yep. and I said, uh, that's no problem. And I remember when I first came back, my whole approach was not to come at Bronson and you know, prove to him that I'm better or prove to the coach. My whole approach was this dude got game. He nice. Talk about Bronson. Yeah. Let me help him out as much as I can and do my part because I know God's going to take care of mine. Let me just do my position, do my role, do the best I can. I focused on that and everything worked out for itself. I got a chance to play in the position I need to while Bronson still really helped us until the point where he eventually took over the 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 mantle you know the position that he rightfully earned right and and what was really cool once again shout out to uh how to be a pro was you use this new mindset that you had 
mm-hmm. to change to help change the culture at Wisconsin. And it was noticeable mm-hmm. from a fan perspective where, mm-hmm. of course, when you, you're winning and you're scoring the ball more, you're making more free throws, higher yep. field goal percentage, whatever. Of course, you know, it's going to look more fun. But it, the change is noticeable. Like everything seemed more vibrant, brighter. Yep. The energy was different. I mean, it, it seemed like you guys were having a lot of fun out there. Yep. Um, talk about your goals with that new mindset and, and changing the culture and, uh, yeah, yeah, doing some stuff at Madison that hasn't been done in a really long time. Well, when you used to walk into our uh, practice facility, you used to see on the banners the last time we made the Final Four, which was 19, like, 40s or something. And I've always been a person that wanted to push the envelope on things, but I even want to do it even more now that I had knew I knew my actual assignment and my calling while being at the school was to come in here, change the culture and do things that had never been done before on a success level that we had. Um, at the time, we had a mentality as a program that as long as we reach the tournament, as long as we go deep in the tournament, good, that's a great job. It wasn't necessarily verbally said that that was the mentality. But it wasn't also pushed for us to go higher to become elite. My whole thing was let's become the best of the best. Why can't we? Why not? Basically, and I remember pulling the guys to the side uh, that junior year and uh, one of our open gyms, and I talked to them and just let them know, like, hey, you know, um, we 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 broke the huddle, and Zebo remembers it, Zach Bohannon. Uh, we broke the huddle. I said national champs on three. And Zebo looks at me and says, no, 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 Big Ten champs first. I said, no, 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 national champs, because national champs includes Big Ten and includes all those other, you know, uh, those other achievements in that. So my whole mindset definitely was to come in there, not just change the culture um, just physically with winning, but really to change the, the culture as far as mindset, as far as like what's possible, what's actually available to actually do. Uh, out there on the court and that like God opens up the door for all of us to do this. It ain't just because, you know, we can't do this because it's never been done before. Like, no, we come together, we ask and we do the things we ask the divine, we ask God for help in this. We do our part. Miracles can happen. And we've seen it. We literally seen it back to back years of us going forth and doing that. It wasn't just because of me. Everybody had a huge part in it. All of us had our part. But I know that that was a major um, shift for us as a program and as our our culture itself at at Wisconsin at the time um, was us believing on one accord that we could actually accomplish what we accomplished. And I like that a lot. I I, I like not setting caps on yourself, you know? Yeah. Like that that was the goal. It was was like, hey, let's get the Big Ten championship. And it was like, yeah, hopefully we see what happens from there. Yep, yeah, yep. <laughs> but, but who, yeah, who at the end of the day, like those are wonderful and those are incredible accomplishments. But people are going to remember those two final four teams for a really, forever. really long time. Yeah, forever. Yeah, those banners yeah. are going to be up there forever and, until, uh, until they do it again, which I, I'm hoping that somebody can take on the mantle and go even higher. We made it, but now y'all need to go win it. Like that's the next step for everybody. Go win it now. Let's not just stay there. Go win it and then go win multiple. Yep. So, so now it's it's not say it's the the players now shouldn't say final four on three. They should say national champs once again. Like, like let's let's go above and beyond what the yeah. best teams did there. And and I want to say this real real quickly. It wasn't just because I wanted to win to just say oh we won. No, it was to win for the to to get the platform, the influence, the things that come with that to let it be known to shine light on the situation that guys like this is possible. Like yep. we came from impossible situations. This is possible. That's what sports is all about. It's entertainment. People that watch the game, majority of people that watch the game don't play the game, but they're coming to get inspired. They're coming to get, you know, motivated and they're coming to get influenced. So if we can influence them the right way to let them know, like, there's really nothing impossible in life, especially when you put a guy in the picture, there's nothing impossible. Then it influences them to go out, man, like, man, I want to be like them. I want to go and do How did they be successful? Yeah. Look, come here. Let me show you how. This is how you do it. 
that was the whole point of winning. That yeah. was the whole point. It wasn't just because I, I say this all the time to people who won the NBA championship 13 years ago. And don't go look it up on Google. No, no, no. Five years ago, two, seven years ago, I two was years ago. Try. <laughs> <laughs> who won the MVP this many years? Like, you don't remember. Yeah. Unless it had a value and an impact behind it. What, why everybody remember Braun's championship? Because he influenced the whole city. He yeah. shifted the mindset of a dying city to, hey, we can do this. That was the whole point of us doing that at school. And my whole reason by doing that is live again. And to get to life, let me show you who life is, which is God. Go to God. This is what this is. We just using this platform of basketball, the thing we love to do to do it. That's awesome. And I, I think I thought of it now, just on an unrelated note. See, you, see, you wanted them. You wanted them to know all the stats. You know all that. Boston oh, Celtics. Yeah. <laughs> see, 2009, I think it was Boston Celtics. <laughs> but you a basketball head. You like basketball. Oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm a very rare breed. Like, I I probably know too much of meaningless facts. Like, I wish I wish there was a greater purpose for all the random facts in my head. <laughs> Like, I, I'm good for that. So, yeah, I couldn't yeah. help myself. I had to show off the random basketball. Now, I could be wrong, but I do think it was I, – I, I believe the Lakers won 2010 and the Celtics won yep. in 2009. Yeah. I believe that's what Lakers it was. Lakers won 2010, yeah, 2011. That's the know-it-all. See, we, we know it. We know 2010, 2011 Lakers. Then after that uh, – uh, no, Dallas won 2011. 2010, 2011. I think – was it the Lakers before? Yeah, then, Lakers won 29 uh, to 09. So they won back to back. Kobe won back to back. 08. Oh, you're 08 with Celtics. See? Yeah, but see, that's but why see, I shouldn't we, try to it all. But look, we know this because yeah. we we talk basketball. But if you don't know basketball, you're like, I don't know what they talk. You can't tell me yeah. who won in tennis in 2008. The the the, the grand, I don't know. But you can tell me who uh the the top players and who won the year with Coco Golf and. And, 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 you know, these things are Naomi Osaka. I, I, these are stories I know, like, just because it's the impact. You can yep. tell me Ali, you know what I mean? You can tell me impactful things in football, Rudy, like, it's impact. That's what people watch yep, sports absolutely. for. They like it for that, those things. That Everything else is extra. It's on top of it. 100%. So, yeah, your junior year, just diving a little deeper, uh, a great year, averaging 10.7 points per game. Four assists per game, which is a lot of assists at Wisconsin. Like that, yeah. that is a very high number at, at Wisconsin. And then you shot 38% from three and 40% from three in conference play. And there's a few plays that like, I, I believe your athleticism and some of the things you brought to the table it isn't appreciated enough. Mm-hmm. And there's three, three plays, three of my favorite plays of yours where it's like, wow. I mean, Trayvon did some things that very few others could do. And one is your dunk against UWM. The, the <laughs> defender overplayed. You, yeah, I believe you turned. You got the ball and you went hard to the hoop. You you yeah. tomahawked that, and you had a six foot seven power forward meet you at the rim. You you yeah. tomahawked that thing and you punch it down over his head. <laughs> and I, I look at that and I see two other Badger guards in my lifetime who could have done that. One Devin Harris. Yep. Two Johnny Davis. Yep. Nobody else, yeah. in, in my opinion, nobody else. Could have made that play. And those are two lottery picks, a top five pick <laughs> and likely a top 12 pick, maybe yep, even top 10. Yep, yep. So that was an incredible play. And what do you remember of that play? I remember hearing jump, and I just did. I just remember hearing jump, <laughs> and head? I did. I just remember hearing jump. I just heard a voice say jump. And it was a big for me because I worked on my athleticism so much. Yeah, you know that year, the years before that, but I worked on my athleticism so much, and for me it was big to trust and uh, just trust. Like God, just telling me, jump. I heard it I heard very clear as day, jump, jump, and dunk, and I just did it. Reactionary, I just did it. Now I had a choice in that moment not to, but I did. Yeah. I remember feeling good. Like I just dunked to see before that though, what people didn't see. I had a scrimmage we played against DePaul. I had practices where I was dunking a lot, and I had scrimmage against the Paul, fast break, boom, 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 guy on my on my hip. I get a steal, two, three dribbles from the other side of the court, one, two, three, four, boom, take off right hand, flush it, and nobody seen that because it's behind closed yep. doors. So I had experience dunking in games. I just needed that opportunity in the game. So when I did, when I heard jump, I was 
let's go. This is it. <laughs> this yeah. is what I need to do. And then the other play is, I'm not sure if you remember this one. It was against Arizona, the first Final Four game, or the mm-hmm. first Elite Eight game against Arizona. It was midway through the first half. You got by your guy, and you explode to the hoop. And I'm not sure who you, if you remember who met you at the hoop, but it was Aaron Gordon. Six foot eight, six oh, foot yeah. nine. Yeah, that guy who stole the show in the dunk contest. He got <laughs> up and he exploded up, two hands up, and you exploded up as well. And you elevated, and with your strength and elevation, you finished that with yeah. one of the best athletes in the NBA now. Um, yeah. And I honestly, I don't know, not just Badger guards, but very few college basketball players in general could have finished that layup. That was an unbelievable play that should be hyped up more because that it was, it was beautiful to watch. And then the third one that I really like was against Michigan state, your junior year, the game winner where you have Gary mm-hmm. Harris, another top 10 pick, or he might've been top yeah. five. I don't remember exactly, yeah. but Gary Harris is picking you up full court. And that was a mistake. Despite <laughs> Gary Harris, you know, being as great as an athlete, as great as a player as he was, you were still able to get to your spot about 13 feet away from the hoop, which you could do at will. And you yeah. rise up, you elevate, you hit the game winner. And you were the best creator on those teams. And I'll explain that further, where Frank was a unicorn. Mm-hmm. Like he was unbelievable. Decker is the most talented guy in the team. Bronson, yep. phenomenal shooter, but you were the creator. Mm-hmm. What I mean mm-hmm. by that is you, there's a reason they were giving you the ball at the end of the games, because you could at will, whether, um, you know, is the game clock or the shot clock, you could at will force your way pass your defender and pull up from that, you know, nine to 13 feet or nine to 15 feet range. You get all the way to the hoop, draw a foul, finish Mm -hmm. at the hoop, or you could dish it out and create for others. They're a hockey assist, you know, pass and that other guy gets the assist. You can get to the hoop at will. And I I just remember that about your game. You were the creator. And I think that speaks a lot to your game that despite having two lottery picks next to you, you were the guy they wanted. Your the coaching staff and the teammates wanted yeah. you to have the ball whenever they needed a bucket. So, man, I I appreciate the hype. <laughs> no, no, dude, that. I got you, I man. Do. I do, man, and I, I I worked on that a lot, man, because we had such a good team of shooters. Like, um, and you're right. Like all those instances with guys like that, I may have scored on or jumped on. They jumped higher than me. They probably ran faster than me. But I knew my first step was second to none with a lot of guys. I can get past my – once I got low enough with my strength and my first step, I could I could get past pretty much anybody I wanted to get to in college at that time. And I had such a good teammates around me where I knew that if I can get – I'm going to have one-on-ones. Like, it's, it's hard to really put into fathom why I had the space that I had because they could – they had to make a decision. They couldn't come off me because if you come off me, I'm dropping it off to somebody who's going to knock it down or going to make a play with it. And if you do want to just, you know, guard me straight up, then I'm going to get past you because I had a mentality where you can't guard me. That was I had to have that mentality at the end of the game because of situations that I was in. If I didn't, I'm getting put on the bench. (laughs) So I need to like that was my that was my specialty was leading the team getting clutch buckets and into the shot clock type of plays and creating and trying yeah. to do that as much as I could in transition too, because we oh, had yeah. such a great team of guys, like you said, lottery picks and guys, Frank, that can do pretty much everything. Sam, who I encouraged so much throughout the time, like, bro, your league now, like your league right now, like you like just put it together. And then Bronson and Nige, you know, and everybody, you know, Josh, who does, who I call cap. He was Captain 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 America. America. We call him Captain America, but like Josh did everything. We just had a really good guy, group of guys that played together, and we we really uh, mushed. Uh, is that the right word? No, Mush, no, jail right? together. Mess, maybe <laughs> mess. There we go. I'm gonna say mush, uh, <laughs> mess together, and, and we 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 did something special for sure. Yep, you guys all had your 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 strengths, you know, and you guys played to those strengths, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, and your junior year, as the stakes got higher, you played better. Um, mm-hmm. That NCAA tournament, I have the stats right here. You averaged 12.6 points per game, 5.2 rebounds, 4.2 assists, 
while being highly efficient, going 44% from the field, 48% from two, and and uh, a solid 35.7 from three, and 87% from the free throw line. What was it like playing so well on such a big stage, and what did that do for your confidence? Man, it did a lot. It let me know that I belong because I knew I belonged out there, but it also let me know that other people know I belong. It always helps you to when like somebody else outside of you be like, you belong out here. Like, yep. this is what it is. You know, I remember uh, looking at the all tournament team thing. Cause we had like to do the interviews for the final four, like the all region team. Yep. And it was like me and Frank who got it. I was surprised because I'm this, you know, Sam is Sam. We had Nigel was balling and I'm thinking like, you know, I just, just play my role, but I looked on there. I'm like, wow. And uh, for me, my confidence was not just in the individual accolades, but my confidence was more like, man, we pray for this thing to happen of us going to the final four and we got it. Like, yeah. that's why, like, our jubilation after the Arizona game was so high because, like, we're all having our hands raised up in the air and just, it was a pure moment of joy of like, this is real. Like, you can't tell me nothing, bro. Like, God is real. <laughs> like, I just, for me in my life, like, basketball meant everything to me at the time. So this just showed up, and this is real. And it's freaky because that whole, people don't understand. I tell this to people, like, people don't understand how real this stuff is because we play pretty much the same exact teams the next year in the in the tournament, which rarely ever happens. We played Upstairs. Oregon. We played Arizona, and then we played Kentucky. And obviously a few other teams, but those were the teams. And so that was more of my excitement more than ever was like, man, this stuff is real. Like, it, I can't I can't, I can't, fake this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Wisconsin – or UW-Madison is a really secular um, mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's, that's interesting true. That's true. Uh, hearing that you – and your teammates were praying for that. Can you just go into like, what was it like being so faith-based as an individual and as a person mm -hmm. at such a secular environment? Well, <laughs> that's because I was the king of the, of the pregame before that. <laughs> they knew where to call. They knew where to reach out to me. They knew, you know, we want that old, man, what my teammates said to me, we want that old Trayvon back. You know what I mean? We went that way. I was like, nah, bro. It's like that old Trayvon would have been – that wouldn't have been still here. You know yep. what I mean? And uh, for me, it was just – it was just – it was real. It wasn't nothing that, like – I never forced it on nobody. I never, like, tried to convert people. Did I offer people, you know, avenues and things that I went to? Of course. Let them know what I was doing. I invited them to certain things. I would say at the time, the stuff that I had. I did what I knew at the time. I didn't know that much. I was just going. But I think for them, they realized, like, something's real about this. Because here's a guy that talked like this, that thought like this, that walked like this, that did this. And he doesn't do that at all anymore. Like, what happened? Like, why did he change? And so, for me, that was huge because it was a... I didn't have to speak for them to see the difference. They saw it and it made them actually ask questions. Like, what do you, what can we do? Like, I see the success that you're having too on the court. Like, I want to know more. I had a teammate coming to me. I was like, Hey bro. Uh, <laughs> and this is a teammate we used to, and I don't, I don't condone this at all. Right. To nobody. But this is a teammate that we used to actually uh, smoke a lot together. Right. Smoke marijuana together. And we did this because for me, it was our ways of our outlets from getting away from the, from the stress of being a division one athlete. So we had a lot of time where we did this together and, you know, I changed my whole life, everything changed, stopped doing what I, you know, all those things. And he, uh, he comes to me one day like, Hey bro. Um, Cause obviously our relationship was affected and I wasn't hanging out as much with him. He was like, hey, bro, uh, trying to come hang out with that Bible study with you, bro. Like, want to hear what you're talking about. And I was like, you? Like, you want to come? I'm like, you sure, bro? And he was just like, yeah, bro. But I knew it was because he saw. 
he saw what was going on. So to me, it's like I tell people anything. Like, don't – I'm very serious about this guy stuff because it's like there's so many people that just use this stuff in vain and it's just they just throw it out there or they just give a bad name to it. For me, the best thing I could have did was I lived it. And that's bigger than any talking. I don't need to tell you. You see it. It's your eyes. And then if you ask, then you ask. But I, that's how I lived it, and that was the effect that it had on me personally. Absolutely. No, that that's a really cool story right there. And, and we, we we talked about this uh, a little bit, but you had a lot of clutch moments throughout your career. Uh, do you have a favorite big shot that you hit? Um, Michigan State was fun. But uh, I would say probably Penn State. Uh, Penn State was fun. Um, Florida, the shot that people don't really talk about that much is when we play against Florida at home. That shot meant a lot to me because, you know, we had got throttled by Florida the year before. Oh, yeah. The year before. And I hit that shot, and it just felt good. Um, I felt like I was in my best place that was my senior year i believe um or my was my junior year that was my junior year and that was a time period where i was at my most freest michigan state was cool it was great but like i think we had lost or something before that so it's always good to like we come into these games and win so um they all meant a lot i think for me the florida game meant a lot probably because of the matchup too with casey hill who was supposed to be another lottery pick at the time i went to camp with them the next year and stuff like that so um yeah that that florida was the one okay good deal i I would not have guessed that but yeah i I agree that one that one isn't talked about as much as the others for sure yeah uh and and an interesting tidbit i i I learned from uh your podcast was that sometimes the coaches would be playing mental games with you Oh, where yeah. they, they would say things like, oh, hey, Trey, you, you can't do this. So you, you use yeah. an example that uh, after the Indiana game where he had 20-some points on the road, yeah. uh, regards like, you're not going to do that again. So <laughs> talk about some of the games that the coaches played mentally to try to bring another level out of you, and did that work? Was it effective? Uh, well, yes and no. <laughs> it worked because, I again, I reverted back to trying to prove to them that I can do this, but it didn't work because it got me in a lot of situations where I tried to prove and stepped out of what I was capable of doing. And um, I didn't find that out until after I left school that, you know, that they were doing that. But it was because like when you're secure in who you are, like that stuff doesn't affect you. At the time I wasn't secure in who I was, that was their best way of trying to motivate me. It was like a military type tactic where it's like, you know, behind closed doors, hey, we got to let him know he's not that good, but we really like him a lot. But, hey, we can't let him know that. We got to keep, yeah. you know. That was their motive of, of kind of trying to help me. And I was um, looking back on it. If I would have did it better in a better way, I would have been okay, especially because it's hindsight now. I look in the game. But at the time, all I wanted was I want to get to the league. I want to, you know, get to where I'm trying to get to. And the best way to get to the league is to be the best scorer, the best shooter, the best this, the best that, instead of like, no, it's be the best you. Yep. Be the best you. And every time I did that, I played great. Anytime I didn't, I didn't play great. <laughs> so that was the the lessons that I learned from that time period for sure. And that kind of transitions perfectly to another question I have. It's something that I really admired about your game is that whether you were playing uh, – a great game or you weren't playing your best game you were always ready to take that big shot you were really mentally tough is what i would say um you 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 never shied away where did you get that mental toughness from uh (laughs) it was a little mix of stubbornness too i I try to really let go of my stubbornness and change it to steadfastness on the good side of things i think i got it just from uh really it stemmed from my my the situation with my dad so i tried so hard throughout my life to prove my whole life that i could be you know better than my dad or live up to my dad or things like that to a point where it actually became a detriment to me where i rejected even help when i should have got help 
So uh, when I got to, um, you know, I and God's image or, you know, the training and things I was doing, uh, my mentor, he really and didn't dismiss it, but he took it and directed it and said, okay, you know, I'm not going to fight you on letting that go. You, you're going to keep that. But let's take that and put that towards this. Let's put that over here. And that's what he helped me do. He helped me use that for good rather than just using it to destroy myself. That's when I really started to hone in on it. And my goal became, I want to do this so that I can accomplish what I'm supposed to accomplish to fulfill this assignment. This call, this things like that. So it ended up working out to a extent, not the fullness that I desired, but it did work out to an extent. Right. I don't recommend yeah, people doing that though. You gotta be a special type of person. As I keep saying, I apologize, Matt, for cutting you off, but like, I'm just not built like that. And I'm okay to submit that. I'm not the dog eat dog fight to get what you want. And you got to eat and grind and no sleep. And you just got to hate everybody. That's not me. I, I'm a happy guy. Like that's just who I am. And when I try to go against that, you, you'll have a, like I heard this quote, would you rather be at, war with everyone else uh with you would you rather be at war with yourself within and at peace with everybody else without or would you rather be at peace with yourself within and at war with everyone else without i would rather be at peace with it i wasn't oh. rather i wasn't willing to continue to go through that route long term i, like, I got to change this ain't gonna work so that's just me that's not everybody else though that's just me <laughs> well i would say for most people having that chip on your shoulder eventually we'll ca catch up with you. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I don't know if it's the most healthy thing to be like, I got to prove this person wrong. I got to do this. I got to do that. Being at peace with yourself, be that's, I want to get there, but that sounds like a wonderful thing. And yeah, I, I don't it, think the, the dog eat dog world mindset, you know, it might be good to help you get a short term goal, but in the long term, I don't, I'm not sure if that's the best thing. You just explained it perfectly. Does it get you results? Yeah, it does. It gets you some results, but does it, get the ultimate results no it doesn't because once you prove everybody then what yeah like mike got to a point where he proved everybody that he's the best but then what that's why he had to go retire and say like all right do i still want to play this? let me go try proving in baseball <laughs> realize like i gotta go do something like i gotta like it, it it's like it, there's this levels to greatness and you put a cap whenever you start to because it's still a form of comparison I'm trying to prove myself according to everybody else's thoughts instead of why don't I just become the best that I can be in the way that I was created and designed to be where there's no limits to that whatsoever. Because if I get here and I put this cap, then it's like I get here. Then now what? Yeah, there's more. There's got to be more. So, OK, and another fun tidbit from your uh, from your podcast that I got was. You, you're you're a big strong guard and mm -hmm. I learned that you were not into lifting weights you're more into doing functional stuff you're really into stretching can you talk about your philosophy a little bit there yeah so early on um I inherited a lot of strength from my both sides my mom and my dad but specifically my dad too my dad's a bigger guy so I lifted weights a lot in high school um because our program was built on lifting weights but then once I hit college that's kind of when I really stopped I did some of my freshmen and uh, my freshman and sophomore year, but then once I hit my junior and senior year, I didn't touch weights. Like I don't, I couldn't tell you the last time I benched, and uh, and it's because I I started to do more band work, um, more uh, things that was to create more explosion rather than bulk, because basketball is more of a lean, explosive type sport. I still kept my strength, but I was able to keep lean strength, and I'm super big on bands and um functional movement of strength because it prevents see the issue with weights is if you use it weights are fine if you use them correctly but we were never meant to we were never designed as people to to lift certain weights that were so heavy because what it does is is it breaks down your tissues fibers ligament it breaks that stuff down literally breaks it and tears it and what makes it come back bigger is it gets stronger and it gets bigger when it heals whether it gets to a point where you can't 
heal anymore because it's been broken so many times. So with the the bands, the bands allow you to warm up and still lengthen and strengthen the tendons and the small ligaments and the things that aren't that when you lift weights dismiss. Like you can lift legs all day, but your knees would be the little ligaments in your knees won't be affected because you know it's not being uh attacked the right way. So the bands allow you to get the same movement, the same strength, but better results and less pounding on your body to where you can lift the bands all day and you look up, you can still do it again the next day. You can't do that with weights. You need to take a whole day in between off. Right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the biggest thing with bands. And um, yeah, that I like about strength in general. Boy, no, that, that is, that is interesting hearing that, that perspective. Like I would have never have guessed that just looking at what you brought to the table in your game. Cause so much like just with your strength, I just would expect all oh, that dude is just pumping iron nonstop. <laughs> so that, 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 that's interesting. But yeah, let's get into your senior year a little bit. So you were um, the quote I want to share with you is um, from John Rossi and a college basketball analyst where he says, I love the way Trayvon Jackson probes on every possession. So savvy, so under control, like a veteran QB that creates extra time in the pocket. That's exactly mm-hmm. what you were. You, um, or the ultimate floor general on a team that was highly talented. You were uh, shooting an efficient 45% from the field, 52% on two point field goals. Uh, you, you were, you were picking and choosing your spots. I mean, at a lot of places you would have been averaging more points per game, but mm-hmm. you were, you knew your role and you played that really well. And then you got, you broke your foot against Rutgers um, in mid January I'm going to tell you, that's one of my, that, that is my least favorite sports injury of all time. I'm going to tell you three reasons why. One, I think you guys win the national championship if you don't break your foot. Because let me just say, Trayvon Jackson, a healthy Trayvon Jackson was a problem <laughs> for those Duke guards. All right. Yeah. <laughs> you were too big, too strong, and also too quick. Where Tyus Jones and Quinn Cook were both really skilled, really talented, but they were small and yeah. they weren't that athletic. If you look at what they did, the NBA combine, their measurements were not that impressive. Their athletic testing, pardon me, their athletic yeah. testing, you were getting what you wanted at them at, at will. Yeah. Whether you take it to the hoop and then mm-hmm. uh, Rashid Suleiman guarded you a lot of the game because Quinn Cook and Tyus Jones were awful matchups to put on you. I mean, you had yeah. your way with Tyus and defensively when you guarded Tyus, Tyus didn't really do much against you. Oh, I, I believe he had like maybe two threes on you, but yeah, he did big threes. He did, yeah, yeah, he did, and I believe the scouting report must have been, "Hey, we're gonna let this guy shoot." That's exactly what it was because you were taking that, off of like, him. That. I was like, "Bump that!" I'm guarding him. You know, he could play. He yeah. just could play. He was just a, he was a, he was an NBA player in his mind already at that age. So, go ahead, well, yeah, bro. he he was an NBA player, but still, you were a great matchup against him, is what I'm saying. Like defensively he did most of his damage against you that game in December when mm-hmm. other players were guarding him. Mm-hmm. And then I think the only time he scored was when you were in foul trouble. I believe it was like a transition bucket. He scored, but he mm-hmm. did not try taking you to the hoop too much at all. He, he waited for somebody else to guard him. And uh, so a healthy Trey Jackson was a problem for those Duke guards too big, too strong, too quick. Like I said, and uh, yeah, they had Rashid Suleiman guarding you. He was off the team um, on the second matchup. So, I mean, they could have thrown Grayson Allen on you, but I mean, a healthy T Jax is going to have his way against that Duke <laughs> team. You were just a bad matchup for them. And number two is you were playing really good basketball um, right before you got hurt. In yeah, the four Big Ten I games was. you played, you were averaging 11 points per game, a steal per game, shooting 50% from the field and 37.5 from three. And like I said yeah. earlier, you were like that savvy, experienced quarterback on a really talented team. Um, you you were you were just playing great great basketball and you were going to be an all Big Ten player. You, you just it, it was it's a fact you were going to be an all yeah. Big Ten player. So it just I hated to see you not be able to have that happen for you. And then number three, as I imagine that broken foot really made the transition from college to pros a lot harder. Yeah, so. definitely, definitely. No, it it it, it was tough, but for me like, you know, talking to you a little bit about it again, I know why I got injured as far as I'm huge on 
helping guys understand that like you are the creator of your reality. You are the master of your destiny. Like you, your choices and your things have certain uh, consequences and things of that nature. So um, real quick, is my screen? Oh, okay, there you go, it's better now. Um, so with that being said, the lessons that I learned from that was I really got a chance to refocus my whole intent and purpose of actually being in that position, doing what I need to do. I, I started to get away from that at that time period. Um, I started to focus more on me instead of we. I started to focus more on, like, I love that you brought up all those points because, quite frankly, nobody outside of my camp, outside of, like, the people that I was with, knew those things were you know, they were destined to happen. Like I, I knew I had hit a point in the Big Ten where I was like, all right, it's rolling. I had like 17 against Penn State, then like another double-digit game Purdue. We beat somebody else. Like I was playing really well. And so do I believe that things would have been totally different? Yeah, I do. But I also would have wanted myself to go down that route, keeping the same mentality uh, to, to, to focus on we rather than just myself. So it, it was tough. It definitely was tough. It made my transition to a pro career uh, more difficult. But it also, the, the, not just physically, but more mentally, more mentally more than anything, because, again, it puts you in a situation where you feel like I got to catch up. I got to catch up to do this. Yeah. Instead of just being yourself and just dealing with the – the route that you took and just doing the best you can in that route. I didn't get that till about my last two years playing pro. Honestly, I didn't get that till then. And that's why I always try to encourage guys on is like, man, be you. Don't be anything else from the outside noise or anything else from this, or this person says, this is what you need to get here. Be the best you can be, become that part and everything and the results to take care of themselves. Because a guy like T.J. McConnell, who I used to look at as like, and we just played against this dude. I went to work against him. Why he in the league? And he became one of my favorite players to watch because he was unapolog- unapologetically himself. And I love his game now. Yeah. No, he's, a, he's a tough dude. Kind of like Aaron Kraft. He's got a lot just of Aaron like, Kraft in him. Yep. yep. Um, so how, how difficult was it playing on a big stage where you were close to 100%? At that moment, I was tough. I remember running back into the uh, into the uh, the locker room because it was a long run because of the the Final Four. We were in a big old football arena. It's a long run to the locker room, and the issue wasn't the foot itself. The issue was the screw that I had at the time in my foot. Um, I could feel that it was like a foreign object in my body. That's, That's what was hurting. Yeah. And I had a heel lift or like a thing they put in my shoe that made the thing like hard. And I was like, I had to tell uh, uh, Henry, our athletic trainer, like, hey, I'm not playing with that thing. I need something softer. And he thankfully, Henry helped me out. He did a wonderful job helping me out throughout that process. Um, the hardest part was just I got bigger. So I wasn't able to do as much, you know what I mean? And but mentally I was still there, but my body wasn't there yet. I yeah, it was like it was like that. uh that that sounds like an NBA player at the end of his career where he's like, Hey, I can't do this anymore. I don't have the explosiveness, yeah. the lateral quickness, you know, the the ups anymore. I gotta yeah. know, I gotta be savvy and and, and totally yeah. change my game. But you're doing that at 22 years old, and you not to cut you off, but when you have a broken foot. You're a really hard worker, but the work you can do is extremely limited. Where I imagine you're just doing core workouts, stationary bike, and then you're getting yourself back into shape on the highest level against North Carolina, Arizona, <laughs> Kentucky, probably the best team of this millennium. Kentucky, yeah. Duke. I mean, yep. that is intense. And you wanted to finish what you started, but that had to be just the hardest thing. Like, I can't even imagine. I give him a lot of credit to Coach Ryan because he – my coach is the one that let me get back to that. And I mean, I know God opened the door for me for sure, but I also want to thank Coach Ryan in that too because 
he, um, you know, allowed me to come back and play. And he was very adamant on that in the locker room. Um, none of this stuff happens if the unseen isn't taking place, though. So I'm not dismissing the guy part at all. But the fact that he even was open, like we were in a pregame speech and he was like, you know, look, guys, this is before North Carolina. He was like, you know, because I've been practicing all week and I finally I came back before they told me I was supposed to play. I was like, I'm coming back. <laughs> I forced my way back. And they were like, look, Trey's going to play tonight, guys. He's going to play. Just let you guys know. And I was like, man, that's huge because Shoei was really in, a, in the lineup a lot of the time. Shoei was playing great for us. So, um, you know, it definitely was difficult because my game was built on my athleticism at the time. My game was heavily built on my athleticism, being able to go up and down. Um, and when you second guess that while you're out there playing, it doesn't lead to the results that you want to lead to. I was able to get some results. North Carolina played well for a little bit. Arizona didn't play well. Kentucky played well. Duke didn't really play that well. But each time it was because I was fighting. Times I didn't play well was because I was fighting. Man, I can do this. Instead of just, again, focus on my position. Focus on what I can do to help the team and just be okay with that. That's all we needed. That's all we needed at the time. So, uh, and did that injury linger um, into your pro career? Uh, it, it lingered. For about the first couple months uh, of my off-season training, but again, <laughs> I give a lot of credit to how we trained and to really what I asked for in prayer a lot, like at the time, to where I, my foot was healed. Like I don't have, and like even I didn't deal with any of those things. The things I dealt with was other things because of overworking. But my foot itself was fine. I was able to get back to my – I was able to get the most athletic I ever got to was in the year 2017, 2018, right before I went to go to uh, play because I was out for about a year and a half, um, not playing professionally but still working out. I just left the D League um, at the time, or G League at the time, and um, I was feeling great. I was good. But there was just other injuries on top of that came over usage. But the foot itself, two weeks after the national championship, two, three weeks after the national championship game, I had a workout with the Jazz. And I had lost 10, 10, 15 pounds, Duncan wow. again. I was good because of we were the intensified training we were doing. And not just the training, but the actual covering that God presented in that situation. Now, I can't dismiss the two. like. You can train all you want, but the camp we were in, dudes got healed all the time. A dude came back from an ACL injury in three months. <laughs> Legit, I'm not lying. You can ask him. Uh, he came back from an wow. ACL injury. His name was Darian Carthon. Towards ACL, three months later, he was playing in the tryout pick a uh, tryout game for pros, and he was fine because it was the the wisdom of the actual training that we had mixed with, you know, just the divine help and that stuff you just can't explain. We had guys break their ankles. They said, no, that was broken. They go to the doctor. Their ankle doesn't show it's broken. Like we just had that stuff and I can't explain it. Like I can't, I'm not going to sit here and explain it. It's like, it's not like I, it just is like you had to be here to see it. And you got to ask them. So that's the type of stuff we had. And that's why had I not had that, definitely it would have lingered for sure that's really cool and yeah after that you had a nice career professionally you played over in the d league at the time yep. um and then you ended up going to slovakia and sweden having yep. some really successful seasons over there so you definitely overcame the injury and i played in uh minor leagues too rochester i always I always don't forget that because those were molding gears too i got a lot of I got love for the minor league guys. It's a lot that you got to go through on that end as well. <laughs> yeah, no, I watched those highlights, man. You you were you were looking nice over in Rochester. Man, I appreciate it. I had to get – that was that was my film year. That's what happens when you choose to go the route I did. You get out of the game. You got to get back any way you can. I, that was the year that I had film. No stats, though. They didn't keep stats for the league. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was – it was a – I couldn't tell you how much I averaged. I don't know. But – the film looked nice. So, yeah. 
<laughs> so okay well we're gonna finish up with a rapid fire round um just answer as quickly as you can okay and yeah let's get into it you ready all right let's do it okay who's the best team you played on the two final four runs second year second year which team oh the best team we played oh the best team we played uh <laughs> duke Duke was, Duke? yeah, Duke was, yeah, they had this, and they had skill, and they had this. Okay. Kentucky was more skilled, but they didn't have this, so. Um, which team was better on your path to the, in the first Final Four? Was it the Oregon team, or was the Baylor team better? Which team was a tougher opponent? Oregon, because Oregon had Joe Young, and he had a mentality that I can beat y'all. Baylor had the better talent, but they didn't have they were they weren't strong mentally. Who had the best home court advantage in the Big Ten? Uh Nebraska, my junior year when we lost to them because it was their first chance of ever going to the NCAA tournament. To this day, loudest place I ever played in, louder in Indiana. Louder than Michigan wow. State, louder than Purdue. It was so loud there, and they came and beat the brakes off of us that game. <laughs> what was your favorite arena to play at? I like playing in Indiana a lot. Indiana okay. was fun. Um, great place to play at Indiana. Toughest individual matchup in college? Keeper Sykes, no question. Keeper Sykes, to the, I talked to him. You know, we talked over the last couple of years and stuff. I still let him know. He hit me with a bop, bop, and dunked it the first play of the game. I said, oh, my goodness, we're in for a long night. <laughs> and it he was. was. A, he was a freak athlete. Who, who's the GOAT of the NBA? That's tough. I'll say my favorite player. I can't say it because I don't want to disrespect of the generations. I think, I think there's generational – Greatest of all times. I would. I gotta go with MJ though. For me, there's still none like him to me. Favorite movie? Oh, you just hit me with something. I don't know. Uh, I don't know, bro. I gotta think about that one. I don't know. That's a good question. Well, no worries. We can go know. back to that if you like. Um, right. Dogs or cats? Neither. <laughs> I'm not wrong. Well, what's your neither. animal then? Shoot, bro. Like, none of them, bro. <laughs> I don't really rock with I like Hey, them. fair I like enough. See, I like to go see them. I say what's up to them. And, but uh, I'm cool. I'm like, uh, I'm cool. <laughs> All right. Um, what's your favorite holiday? Uh, My favorite holiday? Tabernacles. Okay. I don't know about that holiday, but I like that's my favorite one. Feast of Ta- Festival of Tabernacles. Biggest pet peeve. Uh being fake. Just don't be fake around me. Just be yourself. And don't lie to me. Because when your fakeness deals with lying, just tell me the truth straight up. Don't be fake. All right. Favorite place to visit. Italy. I went one time. I want to go back. <laughs> okay. I made some good food over there. Oh, my goodness. Everything was good. <laughs> and then my last question is, if you didn't play basketball, which sport would you play? Soccer, for sure. I tried to go play soccer. My high school coach didn't let me. Okay. He, I tried out, went to the tryout. I was about to go on trial. He came and said, what you doing? I said, I'm about to go trial. He said, no, you're not. Let's go. And I came back in. I wanted to make varsity, so I had to listen to him. So yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> All righty. Well, that is Trayvon Jackson. Thank you very much for your time, and thank you for coming on the show. Man, I appreciate you, Matt. Keep going, man. This is a great show. Um, thanks for having me on. I had a blast, man. Thanks a lot.